So we should start the meeting at 6.01 p.m. If you want to, are we recording and all online yeah. here, Darius? We yeah, yeah, let me, uh, me stoke the fire here. Let me get the, <laughs> crank the engine where they say it. Uh, uh. Now you're good. Okay, we will uh, call the meeting of the Deerfield Elementary School to committee to order on March 10th, 2021 at six o'clock p.m. I do want to note that this is a virtual meeting and it is being recorded uh, just for the record. And uh, we will proceed with our agenda. Um, <clears throat> First item on the agenda is to review and approve the minutes of February 9th, 2021. I'll make, make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second that. Okay. Is there any discussion or notations? Um, no. Hearing none, I would uh, call for a roll call vote. Uh, Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp, yes. Mary Raymond, yes. Carrie Etchells, yes. And Trevor McDaniel, yes. You know, Mary, sometimes there's a switch on the top of the um, thing. If you, you can slide over the camera, sometimes that that shuts it off. And on your top of your top, just a thought. So, okay. Um, Next on the agenda would be the financial statement, signed warrants. Um, as we know, the warrants have been signed, as Shelly indicated in her financial report. And I know she said she had no glaring comments to make, but I didn't know if she wanted to speak this evening. Well, I'm happy to take questions if you have any. I did share the expense reports. Um, and if you'd like mm -hmm. the warrant number on record, Ken, I'm happy to read that. Um, no, I, I can note it into the minutes. Um, it's, it, it is part of your financial report that is will be attached to the minutes. What there were fifteen warrants totaling. Can't remember the amount. <laughs> Thirty-three thousand. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, okay. Does anything stand out, um, Kelly, at all? I mean, you might have asked that already, but I said that earlier. Um, no, as, as far as this year's expenses, um, we're no. sort of maintaining that line uh, that we've been on where we have some savings from positions that weren't filled. Um, and we're looking at right now, which we'll talk more about in the budget, but I'm, I'm looking at probably 90000 in savings from this year's uh, general fund that we'll be able to use in support of next year, which is primarily related to transportation and some vacant positions that Tina has been able to do without filling this year. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you look at the expense reports, you're going to see some overages and some money still available in certain accounts. Those are washing each other out. Um, yeah. I'm aware of all of the reasons why they are either high or low. Um, yeah. We have had to move some things around, and you know I think we're in good shape at this point. Yeah, certainly our nursing, so you know, health services are are certainly underwater, and that's understandable <laughs> for sure. But yeah, and that sorry. was just in part from moving some things from different account lines. Um, it's not necessarily, although there are some increased nursing costs because of the way that Meg Birch, our nurse leader, her position was structured this year in a different way than in prior years. So there is some additional cost there. But I think that account is um, negative about 16000 and it's primarily because I moved some things around. There was a support nurse paid from another funding source, and when I saw the opportunity to have some, we were going to have savings on general fund, I moved that around so that we could use some of the general fund savings money um so Great. it shows an overage but you know technically we still have enough money in other lines to cover it yeah you, you'll Same also you. see um for example one of the areas that we do have money available if you look at the librarian line because we did not fill the librarian position yeah. there's about forty-four thousand available there so that's helping offset some of those overages on the other expense accounts 
Um, but it's, you know, there's nothing shocking happening right. in the budget that you all aren't already aware of. Um, and we still have some uh, COVID money, not from the town. The town, we have submitted everything for the Municipal Cares Act at this point. I did reach out to uh, the town administrator, Casey Warren, about um, the possibility of requesting a little bit more money, but she said that the town needed to reconcile and see where things were at. And it's not actually requesting more dollar-wise. We canceled a technology order because we couldn't get the product. So we're actually oh. under our original request. So the conversation was, okay, can we swap that technology for something else? Um, and she just wanted to reconcile with the town accountant and I, see where right. other needs were at. But we have some state COVID money left that we'll be looking to spend by June 30th as well. So I feel like we're in decent shape. Good. Good. And it looks yeah, it looks like the bill through too. So that's good. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Shelly, for that. Um, the next item on the agenda would be public comment. Uh, we have two public comments. I believe everyone received a copy of an email from a concerned parent regarding the uh, the resource officer at Frontier Regional High School. Um, I know it was submitted, I, I'm assuming it was submitted primarily for Frontier, but uh, the resource officer does does visit um, the uh, Deerfield Elementary School as well. So I will read this into the record and then I will get to our second um, comment, which will be Jennifer, uh, will be with you shortly. So uh, from, this is an email uh, dated Sunday, March 7th, 2021. 9.37 a.m. regarding the resource officer at Frontier. It is addressed from Rafael Santos uh, via the public comment um, link to our site, to our meeting site. Members of the school committee, please accept this letter as a plea to not remove the resource officer at Frontier Regional High School. I understand the national concern regarding officer presence in public schools. However, those issues are unique across the country and in areas where oversight is lacking by school administrators, police departments, and by the community. I'm not sure, and I could be wrong, but I haven't heard of or seen any concerns regarding officer presence at Frontier. My, from my understanding, Sergeant Ravish is well received by students, faculty, and parents. As a parent of a student who has been a part of this school system since kindergarten is now, and is now a junior, I'm concerned of the thought of this removal. In our experience, there have been two separate occasions where the current officer at Frontier has assisted my child and other students. I'm sure those weren't the only two occasions where he would need to be available to students. Both he and the assistant principal addressed serious matters professionally and appropriately, which needed law enforcement intervention, not only administrative attention. I'm not going to get into details. However, in both instances, the resource officer was sought out by students and by parents who confided in, in him and believed he would do his job, which he did. They didn't reach out to a teacher, principal, counselor, coach, or school committee member. They went to the resource officer because they felt comfortable enough to bring the matter to his attention. I personally sought him out on both occasions because the matter needed to be addressed by him and school administrators only needed to be informed so they could monitor the situation. I can assure you that in both instances, things could have gotten worse or never or never addressed, which would have been a complete letdown and disappointment in the lives of the students affected by the events, to include my child. A clear understanding between police departments, school administrators, faculty, students, and parents should continue to be the focus when considering the position of a resource officer. The officer assigned to the school is a resource quotation marks, and is an important asset to the community and school. Sergeant Ravish takes pride in his work both at Frontier and in the community. I've been able to observe him interact with parents and students, which he considers his own. Those are his kids too, and the need to have an officer presence like him is extremely important. Deerfield Police Department and Sergeant Ravish have done a great job with ensuring the safety of our students in Deerfield to the best of their ability. 
please make a good assessment regarding this potential removal from our frontier. I'd be very disappointed if anything were to happen to my child and a resource officer is not available. If and when that ever happens, I will be looking at the school committee to answer and deal with those tough questions I'd have. The budget should not get in the way of this important position either. Officer presence should make people feel safe in our communities, not uncomfortable. Unfortunately, there are too many issues going on that school administrators cannot handle without police involvement. Make the right choice and do not remove the resource officer. Thank you, Rafael Santos, Jr., South Deerfield, Massachusetts. So um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good summation. I don't know, if Darius, if you have any comments or not. Um, it's not a position we necessarily get to in too much depth at the uh, Deerfield Elementary School budget level. Right. So. Um, I'll make sure, I'll reach out to Raphael to make sure that, um, he said at the Deerfield, he may have been confused on that. I realized right. that when I saw the thing, but I also realized that, you know, I can't change the request. And it was also a conversation. I think this conversation was happening at a maybe a select board meeting or, or the such Trevor, I don't your fellow elementary does not does not budget, does not support I, yeah. the resource officer. I heard the comments. Was that? Sorry, Trevor, you, you broke up there. Good. You still there, Trevor? Um, yeah, my my internet's kind of breaking up, but yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can yes. You hear me at all? I can. Okay, great. Um, yep. So I I, um, I I have not heard of a conversation to remove. Um, Sergeant Bravish. I know that we look to funding and we do get help from other entities to to help with budgeting of that. I think it's a, a vitally important position and um, Sergeant Bravish does an amazing job. I have full confidence in him and I, I've heard nothing but great things from faculty, parents, teachers, you know, staff, uh, students. So um, that's all mm -hmm. I can lend to that. Okay. Yeah, so I, I don't know where the, that concern is in this particular fiscal year. Frontier passed its budget last night by the school committee, and it was still in there. So if, he, if, if right. Raphael, you're right. watching, it's, 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 okay. it's in place for next year um, currently. So um, right. I appreciate the note and the kind words about Brian, because he does do a nice job. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Darius. Um, Jennifer Smith, parent and teacher, we <laughs> reached out and said she would love to uh, like to comment or take advantage of public comment this evening. So the floor is yours, Jennifer. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll introduce myself, though many of you probably know me. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Smith, a fourth grade teacher at DES and a mother of a fifth grader at DES and a seventh and eighth grader at Frontier. Last July, I was given the opportunity to work on developing professional development for my colleagues in the elementary schools. <clears throat> With a small committee, we created two 10-week pathways to begin to reflect on identity, privilege, and the history of systemic racism in our country. I'm so thankful that we are in a district that has taken on this work. It's not easy, and because it is hard work, it can get messy. It is personal work, and that too can get complicated. However, we keep going back and continuing to push through difficult conversations, see our mistakes and missteps, learn from them, and try to do better. I'd like to thank Darius, Kim McCarthy, and Tina for being in those difficult conversations and being open and committed to striving to do better to create an anti-racist school district. At the last Frontier School Committee meeting, school committee member Judy Pierce asked to participate in the professional development that the teachers have gone through. In response to that request, I sent to all the committee members the first pathway of learning that the teachers and staff worked on in the elementary schools. I deeply appreciated her request to learn more and to do the individual work that can help keep our school district accountable to its mission and to be an inclusive and anti-racist school. One cannot be a passive participant in this work. We all have to continue our own personal growth in this area so we can ask the right questions for our children's education and for our community. I'm here to invite you to take part in the professional development that teachers were given. I would like to ask you to commit to going through one pathway of learning individually or as a group uh, so that we can grow this work of creating an anti-racist school system. 
which would include an anti-racist school committee for the future of our community and for our kids. Thank you. That's wonderful. How, how do we go about doing that, Jennifer? I'll send it to you. <laughs> I can great. send you the pathway. It's very, it's Please. very, um, you know, it's easy to go through uh, and clearly written out so that you just sort of follow through the sessions. There are yeah. reflection questions to write about or talk about as a group. And so if right. you all agree, I would love to send that out to you. Are, are they online? Uh, yeah, it's a Google document that brings you through different videos, oh. podcasts, articles. Yep. Great. Um. Jennifer, thank you for doing that work and thank you for inviting us to share it and give us the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Yes. I think I'm hearing a consensus that yes, we would like to have the uh, pathway shared with us and we'll give it, well, I'll give it, a, you know, give it a try. I, I, technologically, I, I'm, it, it's interesting for me to try and do things on Google Docs and things, but uh, I'm more than happy to give it a shot and see what, I would love to participate and become part of the process. So it's very yeah. user friendly. You just click on links and it brings you right to uh, videos or podcasts or whatever. There are mm -hmm. lots of features at varying levels of uh, technological ability, and so we we tried to make it as easy as possible. So I'd be happy to send that along. And thanks for making that commitment to the work. Okay, and and I will echo Carrie's. Thanks for your hard work. Um, it's a, it sounds like it's an undertaking that you have enjoyed, and uh, we are happy to have someone as committed as you take it, take it, take the bull by the horns, and you know help lead the effort. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank so, you. Um, any other questions or comments anywhere, Tina? I keep seeing you nodding your head, so I didn't know if you wanted to say anything. Um, I'm nodding my head in agreement with you that Jen has uh, been leading the way with a few other teachers uh, on this work and thanking her for her commitment. Um, she, I've learned a lot from her and um, I enjoy our conversations too. This work is, the pathways are pretty intuitive um, to follow along with. So I'm just nodding my head in agreement. Okay. Thank you. So, well, again, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, it's, it, it's a wonderful outreach, and I, I hope we all take advantage of it. And I don't. I should have um, maybe emailed my statement. I don't know if you want it to put into the minutes also, but I can send that to you right I, now as well. I can give a general summary of what you've stated. If you want to, if you've got a written statement and want to forward it, that's fine. Also, we can add it as a document. But um, I'll do it that. Will be noted in the minutes. And the, the opportunity to p participate in one of the 10, is it a 10 week path pathway or is That's it just how it was developed? I mean, you can do it however you want to. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So there are sort of 10 chunks to go through. 10 chunks. Okay. okay. Great. That's great. Very good. Thank you. And that's a wonderful segue into our next item on the agenda, which is the anti-racism and equity committee update. And I see Jameson is signed in and I don't think it's because he wants to watch the whole committee meeting. So I'm assuming Jameson Eisler is with us again to provide us on the latest update from that that committee's efforts. You are correct, sir. As much as I miss these meetings, I'm not going to come if I don't have to. Um, <laughs> so uh, since I was last year, last month, um, we've had a couple of pretty big meetings uh, to talk about successes and challenges in this year. And um, to think about where we're going moving forward into into the future, you know, and also kind of to remind ourselves that we have not been doing this work uh, as long as it may might feel like we're doing. So to to kind of recalibrate where our successes are in terms of uh, the time we've actually spent really focused in on it, which is still, I think, by my count, less than twelve months. So uh, we. One of the takeaways from the meeting is that communications kind of at all levels is challenging. And um, there's been a proposed monthly newsletter to go out to all staff, students, faculty, family, and school committee members so that uh, everybody stays in the loop around the district uh, with what's going on with the 
subcommittee. Uh, the school policy and procedures subcommittee has been focused on reviewing uh, our existing documents and will be shifting their focus to creating uh, a playbook of policies and procedures for responding to race-based incidents. Um, it was noted that students of color need to be centered in, in terms of communication and policy and uh, that it's not about shaming students who might uh, run afoul of, of the policy, but acknowledging and repairing uh, harm done and bringing a sense of safety back to uh, all of our students and families of color. Um, elementary professional development has been very well received. The elementary teachers now have a sense of common foundation and are feeling energized to tackle curriculum work. High school teachers are wanting a, a little bit more of an opportunity to do a similar deep dive and establish a common foundation uh, for that same kind of curricular work, uh, make it a little bit more substantial. And then our next steps are finalizing our PD proposal for um, school year 21-22, and then really developing a clear roadmap for, for our long-term goals as a district right? and the ongoing work. And so, you know, it's it's been an interesting year to undertake this business uh, with all of the uh, zooming and and kind of the it's been really kind of detached. And hopefully, as we go into the next year, uh, we'll be able to do some of this work face to face and really really build some strong bonds uh, within the community, within the committee, and within the community. Um, stronger ones than the ones we have now, which aren't which aren't weak, but, you know, uh, it just will be nice to see people again. <laughs> Are there any questions you want me to take back to the, uh, to the body? This is like when I teach I, my class and I throw a question out there and it's just silent. Yeah, you know, I have a, I this is Trevor, I have a question. What, what are your biggest obstacles right now that you're running into uh, as you're, you know, either dealing with, you know, these discussions either with faculty or with students or, uh, you know, what, kind of where you're at? Well, I, I, I would have to say, I think that um, different bodies have different obstacles, you know, that I think the high school, it's a little bit more of a moving target. Um, there, there is a, at the elementary school, there is kind of a containment in like the grade level with the teacher being kind of the one yes. conduit of information, right? And then you get to the high school and you're, you're, you're diffusing that message out between all of those different disciplines. And it's, it's been just an yeah. instance of trying to get everybody <laughs> going in the same direction starting from the same place and and um and really really you know i don't think we've had a problem with buy-in um right. but it is you know i think that's been a stumbling block makes sense thank you and and then just you know i think when we do this work we kind of want to solve all the problems right now yeah and and so another um it's been tempering our level of disappointment with what we've gotten done already, right? Because we want we want to we want to solve it, right, and make yeah. it better, and and that it just takes time. Yes, yeah, setting the right expectation, right? Exactly. And exactly. Being pleased with the work you're doing, yeah. Well, thank you enough for the work you're doing, and everybody that's working on this. So. Yes, a lot to learn. Thank you. Well, you know, just. To add a comment, it would be that from every all the feedback we're getting, um, you know, in these meetings and in the community, it, there is progress being made. It just it's not going to happen overnight, as you as you as we all well know. So, um, you know, we certainly appreciate your efforts and the efforts of the committee um, and Jennifer and, and people throughout the throughout the community that are working on this important topic and issue. So <clears throat> thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You guys have thank a great night and we'll see you. too. You yeah. Look forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Sure. Bye, James. Um, yeah. COVID-19 update. 
It's still there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you what? <laughs> that's it. That's all I got. No. Um, yep. So, well, I mean, no, really, there's a lot of a lot has happened the last four, 24 hours um, on the COVID front in the sense of, in education. I did send out it's more. I sent out to all the school committee. If you had a chance to read my email, I sent yesterday. Um, <clears throat> the commissioner. Let me do a, a step back first. COVID right now, the, the rate, the numbers are still very low. We're having successful um, uh, pool testing. We do, you know, those watching, we do are going to do another push to get our percentages up even higher. Um, and and they did extend the pool testing all the way to April break. Okay, so um, so um, anyway, so that's been that's been going well, and um, it's kind of it's not it hasn't been perfect. I don't have everybody participating yet, um, but I say yet because I think we can get more people to come on and do that. Trevor? Um, question, how how would one sign up their child for that? Is it, I know you've sent out emails, is it, is it, it simply just, do we just, how do we get involved? You know, and that has been one of the issues is that the um, interface set up by the company, um, and they say like no fault of, what's well, the fault of the company, but the people of the company are very nice and trying to help us. Yeah. Um, but um, a lot of parents did, including um, my wife, um, struggle to get people to sign up, get their kids signed up because it's not an intuitive, easy go through thing. And if people got frustrated, they may have put it down and not gone back to it or not asked for help. Um, so they've tried to fix some of the, the bugs in the system. Um, and you had to sign up for two things because you had to sign up for the screening. Um, it's cool that we talked about a while back, the Abbott, um, something of it um yeah. you know screening yeah for and then this is another type of test within the same company but you have to sign up for a different test and you have to sign up for both of them because you're going to screen with one if you have a positive test and so it got very confusing as you read through the stuff so i just confused everybody and just by me explaining i can explain what's going on. So, um so you know i think we're gonna do another push to get more people to sign up um you know, we were talking about that urban meetings okay um the community numbers are lower i think um and, and I've been staying low, and I think that's because, you know, two things, I think vaccinations are increasing, and I think um, weather's getting better, all those different, there's many different factors that are, and, and people are still being vigilant, and I ask people to continue to be vigilant. Um, and then, um, where was I going with that? And then, um, and I think vaccinations overall, I think we, we're starting to hear more and more in, about teachers getting vaccinated. You know, I, as an employer, can't ask if you've been vaccinated, you know, there's a, you know, it's a, those medical things, but I think we're, I was talking with um, the Frontier Union today and asking if they could do an informal poll so we can get an idea of how things are moving along. Because um, we just hear by word of mouth. You know, I, oh, I've talked to three people today who, who got their first shot or you know that kind of thing, or I saw three social media postings or that kind of thing. But things are, even the, before the, 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 the 11th, which is the official opening, there has been some you know through CVS and some other means where people have been. So um, you know, and I was talking with Trevor right at the beginning of the meeting as you folks were logging on about, you know, things might open up incredibly in the next few weeks as, you know, there may be a, a larger um, amount of federal um, vaccinations coming in. So going off of that, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just I'm curious, well, as the hopefully the next few weeks to get more availability for vaccinations, will we be able to, will the uh, town or county be able to prioritize teachers? Yes. Oh, excellent question. Nice lead in. <laughs> um, you know, sure. I'll give the overview and then you can kind of give what you know. Okay. Yeah, so the please. overview is that uh, Governor Baker had a press conference today. And, and so you can jump on like WWLP or something like that if you want to see the article. Um, but basically, they're going to do a new login system, which may or may not help us. Trevor can give some detail there. Um, but they're trying to organize. It's not the fastest, quicker in the West gets the, uh, gets the, uh, the vaccination. And they also are creating days that are going to be um, for teachers only. Um, and they gave uh, four dates of that. However, it gets translated differently when it comes to Western Mass because of how Western Mass is receiving its COVID doses. Um, and then that is how I set up Trevor to take it from there. Right. So very, still very, very few doses coming to Franklin County. Um, we, ha we have been able to... Um, I talked with FERCOG tonight, we, we are getting about 2,100 doses to Franklin County um, next week. And we are hoping to set up um, clinics at Treehouse, which is the Channing Beat building in Deerfield for Wednesday and Saturday, because we can catch you know, teachers when they're out 
you know, half day on, uh, or possibly half day, or depending on what they have for professional development on Wednesday, but Saturdays, you know, teachers are typically off. So, um, so we're, we're got, we got all this information from the state this today, really this afternoon that kind of gave us those four dates that we're going to have availability. Um, so I think kind of the rumor has it still we're about 2,100 doses each week coming in for the next couple of weeks and possibly 2,800 doses the, the final week of that third week. Um, and I think once we get past that, we'll get more J and J in the system. Um, and, and we'll start to see quite a bit more doses coming to the area. And these, and these doses that are coming to Franklin County are really just coming through the FERCOG for our, for our, uh, for Greenfield, the, uh, John Zahn, you know, senior center in Greenfield and Treehouse and other different areas that are, that are kind of, we're, trying to spoke out and do different communities. So, so we're going to try and do some dedicated ones just for Franklin County, but the state is really critical in saying that we cannot, we can only withhold 25% for local people. And then you open up to the state. I think when we did ours, you know, a large portion were from Boston and Wellesley and Stowe and just kind of, they drive in two hours out to get a shot. So um, we're not able to really get that. And so originally we've been able to say, Hey, at three o'clock, we're going to make this public that and we kind of send out the link to people and they can get ready to kind of get in the queue and sign in. But uh, and we try to open up a little early so we get most of our local people. Um, but I think the state, as, as Darius said, is changing. And, and I think when you sign on in, in the coming days, it will tell you instead of your 46 minutes in the queue, it'll say we have an appointment for you at this place at this time and you have 20 minutes to confirm it. Otherwise, it's gone, which is a totally different system. So it's really hard to kind of hold those for local. Um, and and really, so long winded, we're really trying. We're trying so hard to get more doses. And I think in, a, in, in about a month, you'll see quite a bit more like when we as we get into April, we'll have quite a few more doses available. And, and but please, everybody go to your doctor, go to CVS, go to Walgreens, go anywhere you can to get it. So if you have a spot, if there's other avenues opened up, even if you have to travel and you can travel, please do, you know, try to do that. So I can answer any other questions, but I think the doses will get better. You know, we'll get more, we'll have more opportunities as we go, but it's rough. It's been rough the last, you know, couple months. All right. Oh, so any questions, Trevor, on that before I move on to the other announcements? So <clears throat> um, yesterday, um, in the afternoon, the we kind of knew this was coming, but not into the exactness of it. But the commissioner um, released the, from Desi released the, the uh, regulatory change and basically is having um, all um, K to five, which it will translate to K to six in our district, um, to go to school, back to school, will we to remove the hybrid model to in person only, starting on April fifth. So basically it would change where we are in our elementary school from going to four days to five days a week for those students who select um, the in-person model. Um, those families um, who've selected the remote model may continue for the remainder of this year. The document also, I did send it to you and it is a, it's one of those documents you can speed read in the sense that you can kind of get what they're saying about and move kind of really through it quickly. Um, but. Basically, um, there is no, and I said this in the, in the email to the school committee, they, they're very clear in here that there's no needed vote by the um, school committee, that this is a, you know, basically a reverting back to the standard in-person practice and therefore it doesn't need to be voted on. So they kind of taken the local power away um, after they, I'll be frank, frank, dumped it on you in the fall. And now they say, well, now we'll take this back and we're going we're gonna to do it our way this time. So, um, the other kind of highlights of it is that they also talked about that next year will not there will not be a remote option given the current trajectory of things. I mean, they can always change if things got bad, but um, so that is that's important for us in our planning because if we were doing dual models and that kind of stuff, if a percentage of our student body was not going to be here, um, those families and they're so basically saying those families who still need a um, to be remote for medical reasons will have to choose either a virtual school or homeschool or the other things that were available prior to um, the, the COVID year. Um, they also need to go, they had a, a long uh, discussion and there's a lot more information coming out from Desi about the six foot versus three feet. And that's kind of the area where um, it's making people nervous. Um, it's kind of the elephant in the room. 
We've been at the six foot model. We're going to try to stay at the six foot model, but basically Massachusetts is saying you can't change your opening the Desi rather than Massachusetts. We're the same. Um, is you can't change your, you can't file for a waiver or anything that if you if you haven't gone to three feet. So it's three to six feet. And I, and I also want to be careful when we say three, it doesn't mean we're necessarily, if we have to change things, all of a sudden you're three feet apart. You're now five and a half feet, five, four and a half feet. I don't think a lot of our classrooms, even in um, prior to COVID, had three foot spacing other than when you're group doing group works or those kind of activities. So so anyway, so right now I think you know we have us we are at six feet and we have kids in four days a week. So shifting to the fifth day, it shouldn't be um, it shouldn't be that difficult in the sense of that spacing. It's going to be difficult, right? You know, you know. I think I have to recognize that the, the teachers, you know, there is a reset day in the middle, um, and we also have teachers doing, you know, um, well, not so much at Deerfield, but um, we're doing dual roles or, and trying to kind of catching up and kind of some kind of a reset day. So there is the missing of that, and we're going to have to figure out when we do our team meetings, a lot of in professional development, um, you know, those kind of things were happening on those on those Wednesdays as well. So there's some administrative scenes behind the scenes that are going to have to happen. Um, again, I met with the administrative team this morning, so we just kind of just started to kind of put it together. Um, um, additionally, just as this, this document as well, while it doesn't affect this committee's role, but the middle school also has to go back to five days a week starting April 25th and 28th, so that Wednesday, so after the break. And that was a surprise that caught most superintendents off guard because they were talking about, oh, we'll talk about that in May. Instead, they went to the last week of April um, following the break. So, um, you know, Frontier's also having to uh, kind of pull things together for that as well. Um, yeah, um, there will still be six feet distancing during eating times um, under their recommendation. Um, and Tina, was there anything else in there that, I mean, that we talked about this morning? I'm kind of going through my notes here, which was written all over this thing. Um, no, but but all the high points. So, but I do, again, I sent that out to all of you. If you're interested about what they're kind of asking um, or how they're, how they're phrasing things, it's really, it's pretty much very, this is the new law, this is the new regulation and you need to comply. So of course, superintendents as you know, all former students who probably broke rules or we cited, um, they, they, we said like, what are you gonna do if we don't do this? So if we don't do it, they basically don't count the time as time on learning and you have to make up those days at the end of the school year, like a snow day. Um, so that was one thing. And then the second option is that they'll take away one day's worth, one 100, 180th of your chapter 70 funding, which comes out to, you know, um, I don't know, I didn't do the math for, I did quickly the math for like Frontier, it comes out to like $16,000 a day for Frontier. Um, so we can also get penalized. So they can get us either way. One, it doesn't count. And two, they can penalize you financially. So they they kind of buttoned up all the kind of loose ends, like you will be doing it this way. So, um, so that's where we're at. Um, we're you know, working out the, you know, Tina's already starting to work on the logistics of schedules and working with the different people that those affect. Um, you know, the, the timing uh, in a perfect world, I think we would have timed it a little bit better with vaccinations. Um, I mean, I think there will be a, a, a good, there'll be good, there'll be some sort of percentage of our staff that will be vaccinated at that point, especially if we get the J&J &J by the end of the month, which is a one dose thing. And after two weeks, that'll fit that, no, it won't, it still won't be in the time frame. but um, this is what they did. So it's not, it's not, it's not our decision, not my decision, um, but that's coming back. Any questions? There's a, it's a lot to say, but really go read through it and it'll, um, it'll explain. What's going on there? Um, I plan on communicating that. I communicate with staff today regarding what's going on. I plan on letting parents know um, tomorrow, kind of the overall plan, putting that email together, kind of explaining what's going on. Um, we won't have all the details that will fall at the building level, but just let them know that that's the expectation coming in early April. I would just say, you know, if you need anything uh, as you're trying to, you know, just reach out. I know, Tina, you've been. Kind of shuffling some furniture around to make room and uh so whatever the town can do to help as well um just reach out so whatever we can do to make that work for you thank you <clears throat> so well it it certainly adds one more wrinkle to this crazy year but um it's a step that the administration wants us to take i guess <laughs> so uh, 
on up through the to the national level. Um, so thank you for the update. Uh, fiscal 22 budget discussion. Excuse me. We would look uh, to Shelley. Yep. Darius, do you want to share the narrative? I do. Great. One eightieth for Deerfield also just FYI calculated quickly is about sixty five hundred dollars a day if we did participate in the five day a week and they withheld chapter seventy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that number. Sure. I think I think. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so this top part, just a reminder here of last year, Darius, you can scroll down a little bit, and then that's the one, two, three, four, five percent increases. So um, just to summarize where we were at, oh, good. Um, last time we met, we had a discussion, the, the draft two of the budget was at 7.12%. Um, just a reminder of what those pieces are listed here, school lunch wages, early childhood wages, and again, that's because of revolving funds being depleted this year um, and not knowing what our revenues will be next year, so we added those to the local budget. Uh, the 25,000 in the special education wages, that's for an IA who would normally be paid from a revolving fund. Um, as a reminder, we're not gonna have that incoming tuition next year that we've had in prior years. Uh, and then we have a $35,000 out of district tuition increase. So those were the primary causes. Obviously we still have cost of living adjustments and step in increases and things like that for um, teachers, IAs, and then non-contract staff. Um, so we had talked last meeting about our options. You know, we had talked about using additional school choice money. We had talked about the possibility of additional revenue in the preschool program and whether or not that would rebuild itself. Um, we had talked about, there was rumor about state, additional state or federal funding coming out for COVID relief. Um, and I had sort of presented you with some possible scenarios if we did utilize primarily school choice, because that was really the only known thing at the time. Um, and since then, we have learned that there is an additional grant available. Um, so I'm Darius and I looked through budgets. We're going to make a couple of recommendations on how to move forward, even though we're not at a point of voting budget and setting budget. Um, we do think that these are reasonable steps for us to take. Um, the first piece is with the uh, SR2 grant. So Deerfield received a grant already under um, elementary and secondary education, which was funded federally. Um, and there is a second grant that is coming out. Uh, Deerfield, I believe, is eligible for about $125,000 um, with this grant, and it is to be used uh, up until September of 2023. Uh, so if we don't use all of it in 21 or 22, it can roll for two more years because September of 23 will put us into fiscal year 24. Um, so the funds can be used to, for similar sources related to COVID-19. Uh, PPE, school distance learning, extra cleaning products, HVAC. Um, but there's also this caveat in there that the funds can be used to maintain existing operations of the school. Um, and the interpretation of that is that if we would be in a position of having to reduce staffing, um, and it's easy to talk about uh, the early childhood or the school lunch program because those are the ones creating the hardship for us this year. So if we were in a position where we couldn't fund those without a significant budget increase, we can use these funds to help offset that budget increase. Uh, so the recommendation is that we use almost all of this funding source in fiscal year 22. Um, it would be about $34,000 in school lunch wages and almost $80,000 in early childhood wages. Uh, those, again, just as a reminder, would normally be paid from the revolving fund. Um, now, we've talked in the past, and I, I know school committee members know this, but just for any public watching, um, it's usually not a good idea to pay wages from a one-time funding source influx of cash. However, with these revolving funds, it really makes a lot of sense um, because like we talked about with the early childhood program last month, the program is gonna rebuild. Students are gonna come back. We are gonna start to see more tuition. It's gonna take us a couple of years to get back to where we were previously, but having this influx of cash to support us next year, 
buys us some time to build up reserves in these two programs so that hopefully by fiscal year 23, we're ready for those revolving funds to take on those wages again, and there doesn't have to be any further impact on the general fund. Uh, so that is the first recommendation that we're making. Um, I think it's uh, fiscally responsible. I think it's a good use of this money. Um, you know, unless something comes out of the blue, I don't think that there's anything that Tina or the school is waiting for, for, you know, like physical equipment or HVAC things. You know, we spent, um, made good use of the state's money and the town's um, generosity with their municipal money this year. So I think this makes the most sense, most sense to support us um, with the general fund budget for, to pay these wages. Uh, so the next recommendation Darius, if you don't mind scrolling down to next piece, um, is to take this year's savings, which I did talk a little bit about at the beginning of this meeting. So right now I'm projecting that we have at least 90,000 of savings from this year's general fund budget. Um, if you remember, we did this last year, we had a budget freeze and we reallocated money around and we're able to free up additional school choice funds to help support the FY21 budget. Well, I'm essentially proposing the same thing, although we're not doing a budget freeze, we just have existing savings from um, some major staffing positions that were not filled and then the transportation is a pretty significant amount as well um, because of the contract negotiation and then credits for remote days. Um, so if we take that 90,000 and are able to put that into school choice to increase our school choice number and then essentially use that money right away, um, my recommendation would be to pay the out of district placement costs, um, spend down that full 90,000 on that for next year. Um, and I do think we have to take caution in doing that because if we don't have a significant increase in school choice revenue next year, and we still have the same out of district costs, we would have to put those back on local fund or our general fund budget. Um, but we're buying some time, you know, and if and the money is there and it's available. So uh, those are my two recommendations. So after taking those steps there, we are looking at going from a 7.12% increase to a 3.54, um, which is certainly much more palatable. Uh, and there may be further opportunity um, to decrease that you know again we're not looking to as far as i know vote a budget or approve a budget this at this meeting so we still have time to work on it but right now that's the number that we're looking at um trevor I, if you have a, your hand up you're muted trevor thank you um just a question on the esser 2 cares act that's um existing money that's not the bill that's in bef you know hopefully before the present year, Nick, um, that's existing funding that came through the CARES Act through the last, last thing, correct? Yeah, so this is new. Since we met in January, we did not have this information. So this just came out um, mid-January, what the amounts were going to be. But you're absolutely right. There's a new portion of funding that is going before the president. Um, and Darius heard some information about it today, I think, on the call with the commissioner. I haven't heard anything um, from Desi, from you know the business side of things, but our understanding is that there will be more money coming. We don't necessarily know how much yet. Um, so this is the second round of federal, and it does seem that there's going to be a third round of additional support for schools. That's great. That's great. Thank you. So if we get you know if we get that money, um, and it is another significant amount. I mean, 125,000 is a decent amount of money. So you know if we're looking at, it'd be great if it was even a match of what ESSER two was. You know that would help bring down that 3.54 percent. Um, again, I just caution us to make sure that whatever we're paying for, we understand that it's a one-time use of funds. You know when we're looking at adding that stuff back in, unless we can continue to um, do what we're doing with the revolving and give that time to build back up. Um, so does that answer your question, Trevor? Yes, thank you. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have a little bit more here that I want to talk about. I want to shift gears a little bit since we are talking about the revolving funds and those being a primary source of our challenge this year. I want to just add in some information for you all to consider. Um, so this is what I'm looking at for projection going into next year, FY22. Uh, so the one point, um, almost 1.1 million here that we're looking at at the rollover, that includes the 90,000 in the savings. 
Um, <clears throat> the revenue that we're currently projected for next year is just shy of 275,000. And then the expenses of the 454,000, that includes the additional 90,000 um, that I'm saying we should pay the out of district placement. So all of those things that I recommended above have been accounted for in here. So we would be looking at the end of next year at a school choice balance of uh, 872,000 roughly. Um, you know, we talked about this last month that revenue has gone down uh, over the last few years and our expenses are not necessarily decreasing at the same rate. Um, and I know we're gonna talk about school choice and students and, and you all are gonna vote on accepting students tonight. So I just wanted you to have some historical information here to look at the budget. Um, we can scroll down a little bit further, please, Darius. So here's the history from 18 to 22. You know, you can really clearly see that revenue has significantly decreased. Um, and I know that you all had conversations and made um, cognitive decisions about how many school choice students you were accepting. Um, but we're really sort of at a point in Deerfield where if the classroom sizes can handle it from a financial perspective, we really should think about bringing in additional school choice students if we can. Um, and then you can see the revenues with the exception of last year, which is really just because of reallocation of funds, revenues haven't decreased at all, even, or I'm sorry, expenses haven't decreased at all, even though um, revenues are dropping. So, you know, not something that we're going to solve tonight. I just want to continue to talk about this as we go through budget because we should start thinking about um, how we move some of these recurring salary expenditures off. And, you know, that's going to be a long process, but I just wanted to put it out there on the forefront in case anyone was wondering historically what we're looking at or um, what the numbers look like going into 22. Um, <clears throat> I did sort of the same synopsis here with early childhood and the school lunch program. Uh, so, oops, I'm sorry, that should, oh no, that's 21. I, I don't have 22 numbers on here. So start of the year, we had about 18,000 rollover. Our revenue is just shy of 5,000 of what we're projecting for now. Um, expenditures, because we did move all salaries off. So the 3250 in expenditures is just supplies, um, snacks, you know, some materials for the program that aren't paid from the general fund. Um, so we're looking at ending the year uh, just over 20,000. Um, typically, the revolving funds, we would want to have, you know, 25, 35,000 as a rollover, just in case there's some crazy unforeseen expenditure. Um, so with moving wages off this year, we're going to be able to be in a comfortable spot, I think. Um, you know, and, and the reason that we move those wages off of 22 is because there's so many unknowns. Um, but we do know that with school coming back this April, uh, you know, I think it's safe for us to make an assumption that school's going to look the same or somewhat normal next year, um, meaning that our classroom sizes, the capacity can hopefully increase. Um, and if we are able to increase class sizes or if more community members are ready to bring their children back into preschool programs, it gives us an opportunity to increase our revenue. Um, Darius, if you can scroll down a little bit more, I have a history here and then I have a projection for you. So just to look historically, um, Deerfield's preschool program um, did bring in quite a bit of revenue, you know, 200,000 plus over the last three years. Um, we had that drop last year because of COVID where we stopped charging, um, but we were covering a significant amount of expenditures year to year from revenue coming in from tuition. Um, right now we're looking at next year based on the current applications that we have and the returning students, uh, the, the preschool director is projecting about 85,000 in revenue. Um, that could change at the drop of a hat because we, while we have applications in hand, a family may change their mind and decide not to enroll. Um, so this is just based on existing materials that we have right now. And because we're not paying any salaries or wages right now out of um, this revolving fund, our expenses would be 5,000 or less just for those supplies and materials again. Um, so if that number is actually attainable, which I don't think we'll know for at least another month, I know Amy is talking about um, getting acceptance letters out to families and things, but there might still be some that change their mind or decide to go with another school or another uh, private daycare. 
Um, but say our revenue is able to come in at 85,000, you know, I think it would be wise for us to try to put at least an IA or two back on the revolving fund and free up money somewhere else. I just don't think we're in a position right now to make that decision because I want to make sure that we're set up for success <clears throat> and not um, failure with this revolving fund. Um, so we have a similar situation with school lunch. You can see the numbers there, start of the year, end of the year. Um, the school lunch account went into the year with 25,000. Again, that's a really healthy balance for us to go into. We wouldn't want to go less than that. You know, you have a freezer or a walk-in break or a stove, you know, you're looking at 10, $15,000 to replace equipment really quickly. Um, so I think that that's a good amount for us to stick with in the revolving fund. Our revenue, are, it's just projections through the end of the year, but based on what I'm seeing from federal and state reimbursements, my thought is we're gonna bring in around 46,000 in revenue. Uh, we have the Deerfield Academy donation that we're accounting for. And then our expenditures right now, I'm projecting out to be about 30,000. Again, doesn't include those wages because we did move those over earlier in this year. So expenses normally would be significantly higher. So ending the year at 55,000, um, right now, we're looking at having the 33000 that I talked about paid from the ESSER grant and twenty five. I do have budgeted to come out of the school lunch revolving fund um, that's paying some of our cafeteria staff wages um, with a higher end of your balance. I think we can safely make that decision. Um, you know, and again, that theme of if we can return to some normalcy, there could be an increase in revenue and we could have additional conversations about moving money back around. Uh, and then I give you a little bit of a history here as well, just to wrap this up. You can see 130 to 125,000 um, last year, a little bit less again because of COVID when we stopped serving lunches in school. Um, but the program had been making enough of a surplus every year so that there was some cushion. Um, I have no idea what USDA is going to do for the fall. I don't know if they're going to continue the free lunches and free breakfast for another year. Um, which is why there's question marks there under that revenue for next year. I can't even make a prediction without knowing at this point what they're going to do um, federally. And then the expenses, the only expense we know right now is the salaries and wages, but we would still have food costs and materials and supplies. So, um, you know, this is certainly a revolving fund that we need to continue to pay attention to. And if we could get additional federal relief, that it would help support this program. Um, but again, there's that idea of we need to build this up in school lunch and the early childhood so that in fiscal year 23, and if not 23, 24, um, these programs are more e self-efficient and able to fund themselves um, as they were in the past. So I know that's a lot of information. I'm, I'm happy to take questions if you have them. And um, recommendations, if you have other recommendations or want to see, you know, the budget uh, in different ways, I'm happy to continue to work with that so that we can get the product that you all are looking for before we vote. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just thought if we could look at this last school lunch history again, briefly, Darius, sorry. <laughs> um, I see you have expenses in FY22 for your initial um, projection with three plus marks after it, which I assume means who knows. Uh, but that's considerably less than the expenses for this year. And this year has been a very limited, I mean, has been a somewhat limited program. Is that, a, I mean, do you feel that's a realistic number that you're carrying right now? Or what, well, how did so you arrive at that number? Yeah, so the only, the 24575 the only thing that that represents right now is the salaries and wages that I know we're going to pay out of that revolving. Okay. Fund. So it doesn't count for food costs. It doesn't account for packaging, you know, plastic right. wrap, forks, like all those supplies and materials <laughs> that are needed. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, Ken. That number will be significantly higher. And the goal is that, you know, at least we will be able to bring in enough revenue to cover those extra things. And then with our 50,000 that we're rolling over, we'll pay 25,000 of wages out of it. So we'll still have some surplus. And, you know, it's just hard to predict right now, um, even based on this year's numbers for um, food and supply costs, we don't have 100% of our students in the building and we're not right. serving 
the kids that are in the building every single day because up until a few weeks ago we were on this rotating you know two day a week mm -hmm. schedule so it's a little bit harder for me to do the projections right now i could look historically and say sure we're gonna we need a hundred grand um you know which if you look at the last three years that's basically what we've needed um, but right. my hope is that we can at least bring in enough revenue to cover those pieces and then we can work on the salary pieces the following year. Okay. Thank you. I, just, I, I was wondering where the number came from. You answered it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. You're welcome. Um, I, I was just going to say, David. I think, oh, go, go ahead, David. Oh, thanks, Trevor. Um, Shelly, thanks for laying all this out in a very nice organized visual fashion for all of us. Um, I'm just curious about this um, CARES, the new CARES grant that you indicated we have sort of since January, and you said that had about 125,000 in it. And, and I'm, so I'm just curious about how these numbers sort of, you chose like 33,952 and 79,846, these very specific numbers. Um, and then what are we doing with this? Should, this should, is there another twelve, thirteen thousand um, dollars to get up to that one twenty five and just yeah, so, we have to so spend those, time. Yep. Those specific numbers equate to specific people. So I have fully okay. laid out in the budget each individual person in each program. So school lunch, so you know I took two of those staff and their wages totaled the thirty three thousand. And then in early childhood, I believe it is um, three IAs that their wages come up to the seventy nine eight forty six. So that's why those numbers are a little bit, you know, they're not a, a straight number. No. Um, the remainder of the money, the state is saying that ten thousand of it has to be spent on um, supporting mental health services in schools. So we're going to be required to spend 10,000 on that. And then if there is anything else left after, you know, that would be at the discretion of the principal, um, or any other needs that come up, whether it's more HVAC repairs or we need another tent or things like that. Um, so the money's not fully planned out at this point other than, um, the salaries. And does it have to be spent in a particular fiscal year or is it no, so we could actually apply for it now um, and use it this year, but we're going to wait and apply for it to start in FY22, and we have to use it by September of 23, which is the 24 fiscal year. So we have several years, and if you don't spend it all, so if we apply for it for next year, it's automatically going to roll until we spend it. So, you know, say we can um, pay... The early childhood wages with tuition that comes in, we could save the ESSER money for the following school year. It's automatically going to carry over for us. Good. Okay. Thank you. So my my question was kind of going back, or really more of a statement, going back to um, the school school lunch and the and the early childhood is that you know a year is a long time in people's. Um, habits change so coming back to buy school lunch it's not going to be in those same numbers for a while i mean i i'm sure some people are just like oh school lunch is ready i'm going to come back but others have found what they do and you know it just takes a while to kind of build up that that clientele same with you know the early childhood is there they've picked their school you know they've, they've made a change and those kids probably aren't coming back for a little bit and so it will take a little bit of time for those those accounts to kind of get back to their historic norms, I think. So it's good to be conservative on those for sure. So the the one last thing that um, Shelley alluded to, we talked about it very briefly that I heard today, um, the commissioner had Bill Bell, I don't know what his essential role is, but he's the Shelley of Desi. Um, and basically says, what is the projection? So there's a bill right now. So we have this SR2 money, it's in front of the Ways and Means Committee right now. So it's, it's part of the governor's proposed budget. So it's not 100% voted on, but they, they pretty much are saying, Shelly, correct me if I'm they misstate anything here. So it's not 100% stamped and approved, but it, they, it, they're assuming that it's going to go through. Okay, there's the strong, they're allowing us to basically um, start <clears throat> projecting budgets with it. At the same time, at the federal government right now, um, you know, I think Shelly said it's going to the president's desk either today or tomorrow. Um, or maybe it already has as we've been sitting here. Um, another 
federal relief package. And the bill said today that one could expect two to two and a half times the amount of ESSER two. So you're talking about a couple hundred thousand for Deerfield. So this might change again, how we look at everything and where we roll here. And again, the smart move by all of you <laughs> to wait um, <laughs> to, to extend this process because we didn't know about SR2 to begin with. And if we try to throw a budget together, we would have been reducing, reducing, reducing. So now we have SR2 where we're at, and now we might get another influx of money. And the question we're gonna look, have to look at is like, how do you play the game, especially if they do it over multiple years? You know what I mean? If, if, and that's one of those things I'm, you know, we actually had a side conversation about like how many COVID, how much COVID expenses are going to happen next year? You know what I mean? And, and are they going to allow you to spend it on other stuff? Or are they going to take the money back? And we're going to have to be very careful about how much we reserve versus how much we use. Um, and anytime we can use that money and not use school choice, meaning because then the school choice, we could always use later for certain things. So we're going to have to have, those will be discussions kind of moving forward. Um, and that's another reason why we don't have a budget yet. So I know Trevor, you're, just, you're select board here, but I know some other people were watching tonight because they asked me for the address. Um, you know, that's the those are, that's the that's why we're dragging our feet because we might have better news or yes. you may have to rechange things up before it goes to the town. Well, yep. <clears throat> well, certainly this this budget is. Um, is much better news than we've been looking at. Thank you for for the effort, you know, for this work and, and presenting it so clearly, Shelley and Darius. Um, you know, it, it puts us at three and a half percent instead of almost 7.2 percent. And uh, it gets us into a range that I, we can have a conversation with the, the town fathers and the finance committee and and see see what the thoughts are, because we are it. it as you've noted, is a level funded or a level budget in terms of services. Um, obviously, it's never going to say the same in dollar amounts simply because of the obligations we have on, on salaries and mm -hmm. increased costs for uh, various benefit expenses and things like that. But um, this is a uh, this is a much, much better one. I'd like to see if we could at least forward this number to the select board and finance committee as where we stand now with that word of caution mm -hmm. that you just, you know, that you just stated Darius and, and both you and Shelly have said tonight that this is where we're at. We still have more information coming in so the picture can hopefully change to mm -hmm. the, to the better, but what let's find out what the town fathers and finance committee think of the three and a half percent. Could I, ask about the um you know as we, i don't know if we're going to get into the budget or this was just you know kind of review but uh, you know it, under um under the paraprofessionals the salaries for kindergarten ias were you thinking uh, tina do you see a need uh, or darius you see, you're seeing a need for kind of adding some of that support or is that moving from something else or you know i noticed there was about a you know fifty thousand or so or sixty-one thousand dollar change in the IAs total. I mean, some were reducing, some were increasing, but just wondered how how does kindergarten feel like for the coming year? Tina, how do you feel about that kindergarten for the coming year? <laughs> <laughs> it's, around all that information, um, I do believe, and Shelly, you can correct me if I'm wrong. That kindergarten, there's you're going to need some extra support this year, given the needs. Yeah. And and that's kind of what I thought all around is that, you know, this just catching everybody back up. I mean, once we can all get together, I mean, we really need to assess what happened last year. Where are the kids at? What are those extra reading needs and, you know, math needs or, or you know, what, any kind of need? Um, it's, Trevor, just, that's, it's not actually even related to that. It's special yeah. education. Right. Oh, okay. Yep. Those, those, those areas are okay. Gotcha. But I still feel like I'm concerned about where our kids are at for sure. Go ahead, Shelly. So I just want to point out that while the numbers look like there is additional, um, IAs cause there is a $50,000 increase compared to the prior year, we yes. haven't actually added any staff. Right. Um, okay. so you know, 
last year or this year when we um, saved money and had extra school choice expenditures, some of those naturally got put back on this year's budget because that was a one time decision to move things around. Yes. So it looks a little bit deceiving. And I can okay. see why one would think that, OK, there's this fifty thousand dollar increase. We must have added staff. But if you look at, you know, a couple lines above that, we have, you know, a thirty three thousand dollar decrease. So yeah. it's really sort of just I cleaned up a lot of the numbers, but we yep. have not added any IAs. In fact, yep. we did um, decrease one IA because of the. Uh, me. Oh, I can hear you. Yep. Okay, everyone yep. was frozen on my screen. I know. I, <laughs> it briefly froze. <laughs> oh, I thought maybe I was talking to myself for a second. Nope. <laughs> um, I don't know what you heard or didn't hear, but yeah, if we I haven't added that. any staff in was okay. the point yep. that I wanted to make. No, that's helpful to clarify as people look at that. As I was looking at it, I was like, oh, we're, are we, do we see any need? But it's just kind of adding back from what we had taken off the, the year before. And, yeah, um, and it doesn't mean that a need a need might exist. You know, right. we certainly might have to look at that. Um, but we did actually reduce one IA. I believe there was a vacant position, um, yep. so it didn't mean that anyone had to be let go. But we had that reduction in um, the special education program, so there was a one to one there for that right. student who won't be there next year. So we're actually down one position, um, yep. I believe, for next year. I think Tina, is that correct? Yeah. She's nodding her head. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but we're we're still finding out who's coming back and what those needs and any additional needs that might be coming in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and as we as we move on a little bit later in the meeting here to school choice, we never know what school choice will bring to us either. So, True. Um, <clears throat> so, um, any other questions for Shelley at this point in time? It's uh, you. You have my sympathy trying to craft a budget in this year. Uh, We're very is, grateful. It's no work. easy task, and yet you, you you show up with a smile every meeting, and yeah. um, I imagine you do that in all all of the school committee meetings uh, for the the towns well, and I, the region. <laughs> I feel like this is a recurring theme here. You guys said the same thing last year. You don't envy me having to create budget in the circumstances. So maybe there next year will be easier. Yeah. Well, you do. I great certainly job. hope so for your sake and yes. for all our, our sakes. So, mm -hmm. um, so any other questions out there? If not, we will move on. Uh, to school I, I hope the committee doesn't mind that I ask the administration to at least forward this draft budget on to the select board and finance committee are we all in agreement that makes sense yeah yeah I have to get their feedback okay thank you um, we have a school choice vote which means we have school choice information to consider <clears throat> And I don't know who's presenting it. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't seen any in the. Oh, we so just... my mistake, Darius, was I supposed to send over a draft? I have it. Why don't you just present your screen? Yeah, you could share. I assumed you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's on my hard copy. She's I good. thought we were talking about just if we're voting or not. And yeah. I might have miscommunicated. That's about okay. the numbers, but so, I can go through them. Oh, we're yeah. not. We, yeah. we um, do all get that chart, um, you know, the classroom chart in our, yeah. in our series. Yep, I can I can get that to you shortly after the meeting. I think I miscommunicated or misunderstood a conversation that I um, that I had earlier. I thought we were just voting. <laughs> no, I, I'm voting it. I look at the chart. I appreciate you falling on the sword that I did not communicate with you effectively. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's a that's a good administrator. You're gonna make it someday. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't reach out and ask either, so I can accept part of the blame here as well. But I'm um, gonna keep trying. Yeah, um, yeah well, tell yeah. us your thoughts, anyways. Yeah. So, um, 
without having a whole lot of information on what class uh, spacing is going to look like next year, my recommendation would be to vote yes to school choice, that we can accept school choice, but to have some leeway around how many students in each classroom that would be. Uh, right now, we have 32 kindergarten registrations and eight school choice. Um, depending upon our um, our social distancing, we may need to open up a third classroom with those numbers. And so um, I would anticipate taking school choice along in kindergarten. Mm. Um, right now, it's really hard to decide how many we could fit in if we wanted to look at um, different classrooms and class sizes because of the social distancing. And um, we're too, uh, I'm, our, you know, we're using every ounce of space. So, yes. and, and Darius, I know there was alluded to, we might go back to somewhat normalcy in September. And I don't know if that's, if that is on the, on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically what I've done so far at the other at Frontier and Waitley have already gotten ahead of you guys this month, um, basically asking for the discretion of the principal, you know, not to create new sections using school choice, but to fill out the current sections we have um, in the discretion, you know, basically opening it up in all classes greater to equal than one, um, you know, per class at least. And then because um, the idea is also, you know, the principal also can look at the needs of the classroom. Um, yes, it's not always just a numbers game. Sometimes that there's high needs in a classroom where you can't just add additional students, um, right? Based on the you know the, the demands of those the needs of those students. So um, that's basically you know basically school choices an up or down vote. Either you want to be a school choice school or not, you'd be crazy not to be. Um, but and then you know we, we kind of talk you know you know how much per classroom just so you have an idea of what's going on. So this year we don't. Um, you know, we, we're still counting the numbers for each grade level. We, you know, we're gonna see who's gonna be coming back. And so we may have to do school choice acceptance in stages. There might be a stage one and then a wait list, um, depending on how many applicants we get in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So- um, Can I ask a quick question? I'm sorry, I was sure. confused by Tina, something you just said. Did just, You started off just talking about kindergarten and you said thir there's 32 registered and then eight school choice. Did you mean already school choice applicants or of that 32, there are eight who are school choice? Great question, thanks for that. Um, there's 32 registered and we have eight school choice that we could consider. And then, and then we, go ahead, sorry. Of the eight school choice, two are staff children. So um, those are gonna be scooped in. So there are six school choice. There you go. <laughs> so, Okay, and then but then you said something about we with those numbers we may have to add a third kindergarten section. Yes, because if we have the same um, social distancing that we have now, because we're kind of running out of room, and right now we have, I have the numbers in front of me. We have about fifteen in each room. Okay, so, but okay, so you're talking about possibly seventeen. It's okay. So I know it sounds like a, it sounds like a little bit of of little bodies in a room, but we also don't forget a lot of kindergarten is kind of those that play um, and those stations that they need to go to, and we really kind of cut down on that in the classroom. And I'm not sure how much more room we have. Plus, they have tables and not desks, so each kid has a table and not a desk. So, depending upon where our social distancing um, lands, uh, three feet or six feet is going to be huge for us. But, but isn't, doesn't that raise a, a bigger budgetary issue if you're talking about adding a teacher that we haven't considered here? Or are you taking a teacher who's going to lose out in a different grade because of the numbers moving through? Yeah, so um, I, have other <laughs> I have other conversations uh, to have, be had with Shelly. I just got these numbers today. Um, yep. and, and looking at those, I have a, um, and I don't think that we're going to need to add money to that. I have a, a different proposal that I probably don't want to go public with right. until that's I fine. talk to Shelly and Darius. Still working some things out. That's fine. Yeah. 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 Okay. So right now, do we have two classes or do we have, we have two this year, right? But possibly yes. three if we get more influx of kids and, and, and we're still dealing with, you know, space. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. I mean, prior, if it, correct me if I'm wrong, but prior to uh, COVID considerations and um, 
physical distancing and everything that's involved with it. We had talked at some point in time about kindergarten classes really approaching what I would call almost inefficiency at around 16 students per classroom. Yes. Um, and here you're talking about potentially two classes of 20. Um, yeah. That's uh, if we if we open up the six additional spaces, we have two staff. If we if we participate in school choice, we have two staff that would school choice in. Mm -hmm. um, that would put us at 34 kids. So that's right at 17. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to understand how we could add six additional students to well, get to 40 it, without considering another classroom move. I, yeah, I wouldn't add school choice if our social distancing number stays where they or reduces. If our social distancing number stays where they are at six feet, we may have to open up another classroom to fit the students in, if that makes sense. Yep. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And, and if Ken, you do, you're then right. You're... Going back to those uh, school choice numbers, we did talk about keeping class sizes small, particularly in kindergarten and the lower grades. Um, to help us with those intense targeted instructions uh, mm -hmm. along the way. And that's what you're seeing as far as the history of school choice too. Mm -hmm. And there was conversations <clears throat> that when they got up into the older older grades or the upper grades, that we would then continue to plug school choice back into there. And we just haven't gotten into that wave yet. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Um, that's helpful. So, um, can I so, just say, in any case, I didn't to say it. Um, it I just want to be. I think um, it's a slippery slope if we're adding teachers to teach school choice kids. If that's the reason we're having to add teachers, I mean, I'm all for our. I mean, our school obviously is very attractive, um, and it's maybe helpful budgetary or not. Uh, I also am not keen on you know, poaching kids from other districts and creating the, you know, flow of the deterioration in other districts that um, are losing, losing kids to ours and losing money. So mm -hmm. I just, it just seems like it's a, it's a, it's a, it would be somewhat controversial, I think, to add a kindergarten teacher to, to add six school choice kids. Can I speak to that second? Or at least something we would need to discuss. Yeah, I, I, I agree that um, I think our, our intention as a board has been for a while is that we would not be interested in adding a, just another classroom uh, teacher, you know, just so that we could accept school choice. That was the whole reason we went to two to begin with. And I think what Tina is saying is that we would only uh, add them if, if our own native kids uh, because of spacing and just trying to keep those small. If if we were going to end up just for our native, we are going to have to add one more classroom. Then we have the space, and that's when we agree it makes sense to allow some other kids into there. But but our intention, I hope, I think Tina agrees that we would not be looking to do three just just so that we could get in school choice kids. Thank you for clarifying, Trevor. That's exactly what I'm saying. Is right now we're on the cusp. Right yep. now we're on the cusp. We're going to hold it at two classrooms, put it on your radar. If we do get more kindergartens enrolling and space stays the way it is, we may need to look at adding another teacher. If we do add another teacher, we would have room to add school choice. Right. We're not looking at adding another teacher because we have eight school choice. Right. And wouldn't, sure. at this point, wouldn't we expect a couple more students anyway between March and September? Yeah. I believe, I feel like this is a reoccurring theme that I've talked about every time this year of put it on your radar because typically what does happen, Carrie, is you're absolutely correct. We get an influx typically over the summer and towards the end of this year. And with the numbers at 32, this is about where we are every time this year. Last year, we um, the school closed and enrollment dropped and we didn't, have to, we didn't need to have right. a third teacher. Uh, this year, I anticipate, just given the numbers where we are in history and looking at patterns, that we may need to look at adding a third teacher. Just want you to keep your eyes on the, um, the number of enrollments and just kind of be aware if we come back down the line. With that said, I don't think it's going to um, impact the budget given some of the other resources that I've been looking at. Okay. Okay. 
How about Ken? How about for just a I think process wise, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, is that let's do a let's vote that we become a school choice school, and then mm -hmm. that we will do an enrollment report on you know you will, you will have an idea of preschool enrollment and kindergarten enrollment at well we have a joint meeting in next month so maybe the next time we have a meeting she can put that together in something that can share with you guys ahead of time so you can look at the actual numbers and we can see how they're changing as the spring moves forward um, but right. meanwhile right. we can accept we can accept school choice applications but we're uncertain the number of slots that are going to be open yes. that allows us, you yeah. voting to be a school choice school allows us to collect school choice applications and then also in the grades we're only adding one or two people we can go ahead and get those families secured for their plans for next year and then kindergarten we may have to say you know what we're not going to be able to make that decision until may um mm -hmm. due to the um uncertainty of our class sizes right. uh, that's uh, that's essentially what i was going to suggest is it as a motion would be the a motion to agree to participate uh, to participate in the school choice program for the fiscal 22 year um with the in, with the added instruction that um, we be provided with enrollment numbers at, at future meetings before slots are filled. <clears throat> I would second that motion, Trevor McDaniel. That was just a suggested. Oh, well, you, you laid <laughs> you it out. You can make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the motion then, just as that. I think our intention. So thank you. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Carrie. One good question. <laughs> Maybe I won't, but one good question the legal authority of the school committee has to make that decision. I to think you sense. only have the authority to be a school choice school or not. And then you could also have the, the choice of whether or not you'd expend to extend grade levels, but I'm not sure you can choose whether to have two people add to fifth grade, one add to sixth grade. I, I wonder. I don't think I, I'm more right. concerned with whether there would be impacts on our staffing needs. Yeah, that, that certainly would be all in your jurisdiction. I'm yes. just saying because the general law doesn't say that the school committee can choose how many per grade level. Correct. Right. Um, it says whether right. not you'll be a school choice school. But if we're trying to expand the grade level, you, that certainly falls in your authority. I'm just trying to be. Yep. Mm -hmm. clear on that. I want to battle with you guys. That's what I really want. <laughs> <laughs> we trust you. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Do we have any other questions from people or concerns? Um, we, we've been tied to school choice for so many years now that I, I they, to not participate in school choice and continue um, down the path that we've been on would be pretty devastating to our budgetary considerations. That yeah. much I can, we can all see, we can all see the handwriting on the wall. So, <clears throat> um, I agree. It helps. Where Go it ahead, helps. Dick. I just again just make it as a general observation. I mean, I'm all for maximizing as many tax dollars as we can and put them into our elementary school. Um, but it seems like we should keep an eye on um, the number of students that we had, for instance, in the last school year compared with this school year, and the and the fact that the budget is similar would indicate that our cost per student that we are um, paying for for our school has gone up which is mm -hmm. a wonderful thing uh i think uh, but it should it also means that we are should be a very well resourced school per student um and yet um you know we're not as kenny was talking about some programmatic things we're not necessarily adding things here right. uh, for the kids um or for the teachers or for whatever so so i'm just curious at some point it would be interesting to see that number because i if my memory is correct we may have dropped 50 kids yeah you dropped 75. 75 which mm -hmm. is a, which to me is an enormous Huge. percentage yep but let me clarify that yep. 58 of those students are in pre-k and k where where families have the ability to say screen learning is not going to work for my child um and we're going to try you know i need child care with the pre-k option where we could not provide 
um, in service um, out of this out of the gate for school. So, you know, you're really just talking about a, a 17 number difference for the rest of that. Doing the math for you, so okay. we're down really just 17 if you don't remove those two those two early childhood years. So we're down 58 kids in the early childhood years. You're saying pre-K and K. Yep. Pre-K. Okay. Okay. Well, that that's a different analysis then. Okay. Okay. No, I mean I have a, I mean I have the we're we're charting that as well and looking at those school trade numbers and I can I'll okay. get you guys this this document as well so you can kind of see through the years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, um, our actual school choice um, in went from sixty seven to forty seven in that as well in those numbers as well. Okay. From from um, from nineteen to twenty. So. So. Yeah. Right. Okay. No, I forget. Yeah. It's a different analysis then. Yeah. It's yeah. not. It's not evenly across the board, then it's something that could change quickly back up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is something we've juggled for our entire time with school choice is that when we started, we were able to use it, David, to do exactly what you're talking about, to expand programs and offer services that we hadn't previously offered. Um, but over the years, it became increasingly a supplement to the general to the general fund budget yeah. uh, or okay. supplement or aid to the general fund uh, efforts so uh, and now we're faced with the need to to wean ourselves off of that dependence and get back to everything being supported through the general fund <clears throat> so Shelly has that enviable task what's that right, but, and you have to understand that you're part of a, a larger organism of the you know, K to, to 12. And so to 12, you're, the, you're the biggest feeder of school choice into Frontier. Mm -hmm. Frontier relies on school choice, not just budget wise, but in order to have the progr the programming that it does offer, if we reduced by the number of school choice, we would have to reduce the number of elective offerings and right. science offerings. And, you know, we'd have to be a very basic school, but those extra basically 160 students overall, um, allow us to have fuller programming. So it's kind of like this thing, like you guys are the, you guys are the biggest fish that's feeding the other fish. Um, if, there, if you, you mess up the eco chain, it does have a ripple effect through. And so um, I'm just saying that out loud, I'm not worried, I'm not worried about the changes that we're having right now, but it is something that I keep an eye on too. Like, what are we feeding in? And if there's a, if you suddenly stopped, right. it would have yeah. a ripple effect all the way through it several years later, mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of stuff. But it's, it's just interesting how we are, <clears throat> intertwined that way right that's a great point i think frontier should fund our third kindergarten teacher <laughs> it's about sixteen thousand four twenty eight per year in 2019 is kind of what we spent educating a child mm -hmm. round numbers okay so so we do have a motion uh with trevor making the motion and carry uh seconding any further discussion on school choice, participation in school choice? Um, seeing none, uh, we'll go to a roll call vote. Um, all those in favor, Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Uh, Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. Gary Etchells? Yes. And it carries to five to nothing, five zero unanimously. So um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tina, for providing us the update. And uh, we look forward to seeing a few more numbers <clears throat> involved with it. And uh, we can move on to reports. Um, the committee slash chair, the only thing I would say uh, uh, as part of my, as my report would be that I have been participating in the Capital Planning Committee meetings. Trevor sat in on a meeting last week to um, update on some select board initiatives, but uh, also provided some insight into uh, what's going on in the school. Um, and the, the committee has voted to approve the, or to recommend the um, carpeting and um, uh, restroom uh, renovations uh, projects that were, were submitted. Um, and Trevor's got a hand up. Well, Ken, I was going to ask you about that. Um, I know you had you had kind of talked that this would be the last bathroom. I think this is the last um, 
public, right, uh, shared bathroom maybe we would do at the school. I just wanted some clarification because I think I was under the impression we were going to kind of go and start doing like kindergarten bathrooms and like keep going a little bit on that. But I maybe I'm wrong. I just did know if there was still some need there. The, the initial plan, I, what I had referred to were the initial plans we were given were the primary public bathrooms at the entrance of the cafeteria and then each of the yes. classroom wing bathrooms. Yes. Um, yep. We had never had the recommendation or proposal submitted for the kindergarten or faculty class, oh. you know, upgrading those facilities yeah. that I'm aware of. I may be okay. wrong. Um, I, I had thought originally when I kind of did a walk through, this was several years ago, just looking at the needs that there were some like in like the preschool bathrooms and stuff were in, in yeah. pretty bad shape. And just sure. a thought that maybe we should look at, you know, since we've been doing that, maybe they don't need as much of a huge, you know, they don't have partitions or anything, but maybe there's some things that we could, you know, just make sure those are still good shape. I don't know, Tina. Are you, I was going to say, are you sure that's not on there, Ken? Because I think it's um, just included in the number of bathrooms. I don't think it just says which ones, but Trevor, right, you're I, absolutely correct. We did talk about preschool. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't recall all of them, but I, yeah, yeah. I, I remember the sequence being the three classroom yes, wings and uh, for sure or the, the for classroom sure. wings. And, Those were the you know, we were reaching the end of that. If we have more to come, that's, that's fine. We'll, uh, okay. Yep. We can we can continue it or certainly put it back in. I it's okay. These are not major from my perspective, major capital expenses, and the school has been very diligent, and the administration has been very diligent in taking these major expenses that, if you did them all at once, would be a significant hit on a on a tax year, and spreading yep. them out over two, three, and four years, which uh, makes the most sense. Um, yes. Um, so certainly I would, I'd be supportive of bringing them. I, I, I would point out that uh, March 28th of 2021 is the 30th anniversary of the groundbreaking oh. ceremony for wow. the Deerfield Elementary School project. Oh, that's kind of um, neat. Well, I, 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 I knew it was something like, I knew we were closing okay. in on 30 years, but I, I, in my shed out back, I have a shovel hanging there that has that was used in the groundbreaking, oh. and I had to pull it out for something recently to uh, use it. And I noticed the dates on it were uh, March twenty eighth. Oh, that's <laughs> so amazing. thirty years ago oh, yeah. on March twenty eighth. If you if you want to have a celebration with yes. whoever's in the school at that point in time, Tina, feel free. That's pretty <laughs> exciting. So, that's great. And then we would have. Um, 18 months later, the 30th anniversary of the move-in into the building in January. Okay. So the school wants that solid gold shovel back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was looking at it thinking I've seen them uh, plated and uh, with yes. really neat stuff. This had sort of the uh, the old embossed tape that you could make you and they yeah. they taped them onto these. I think they had about 12 of the shovels. I wasn't here for the ceremony. I had to be out of town, unfortunately, but they uh, taped these, uh, the notation and the date and everything on them. And, it, and it's hung on this long, 30 years later, it's right. still, well, what's left of it is the, yeah. the numbers are still there. So anyways, um, but yes. Uh, and um, so the, the capital planning committee has approved what we had submitted to them. Uh, for to recommend uh, what we had submitted to them, so those will, projects will hopefully continue to go forward after town meeting. <clears throat> so, um, the uh, collaborative. Anything from Carrie? Uh, nothing. Yeah. For the off month for collaborative. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, and. Principal's report. We all received a copy. Thank you, team. You're welcome. I'll just go over really quickly because I know we've all been here for quite a while. Um, with the five days a week, I thought you would like to hear where we are as far as numbers. We have 80% of our students are back in person. Um, that's about 255 students and 20% remain remote. That's about 60 students or 62 students. 
Um, we are starting to see a slow and steady um, stream of students coming back to in-person. We had five come back in March and we already have two on the list for April. Um, and our numbers that, if, if in case you were curious, our numbers went from 70% in October to 77 when we switched to phase three, which was four days a week. And now we're at 80%. That's a little bit mm -hmm. some data for you. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to our nursing team, Katie Smith and Meg Tudrin. They have done an outstanding job of organizing and monitoring and responding to our pool testing. We have a little over 100 community members. I know we were talking about that um, earlier. That's about 32% that are participating. I'm constantly sending emails out and hoping that families register. We have, you know, we've asked families to reach out directly if they can't get on. Um, and, you know, they're, they're doing a wonderful job. Uh, everybody in the building is tested uh, with li little over an hour. Go ahead, Trevor. Is it? Uh, can you explain for the public what what the process is of a of the test? Is it kind of just a no swab or a what? What, what do the kids do? Yeah. So for the older uh, kids, I think it's grades three and up. They can do it themselves, and it's a Q-tip, and it's five times in one nostril, five times in the other. Yeah. And then they drop it in a tube. All um, from what I understand, there hasn't been any um, negative, I guess, uh, impact yeah. of that. Students are fine with it. Some students who want to attend, they're like, why can't sign me up? And we're like, oh, they didn't. Uh, so it's it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> all right, Mr. Modesto, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I have great. all these comments I can make, but none of them are appropriate. Oh, it's right. <laughs> Here's a Q-tip. <laughs> Yeah, that's great though. Thank you. Just so people know what it's all about. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Continue. Um, let's see. So, you know, another big shout out to the uh, Treehouse Brewing Company, which is the old chaining feet, but they've uh, provided us with storage space. Um, you know, thank you to the strength and muscles of our uh, PD department, our town highway department, our custodial staff. For moving, we've moved, uh, I don't even know, I can't even make a guess, 20 truckloads of furniture from our gym to free up some prime real estate for learning. Because um, now that we're coming back five days a week, we're going to need a little bit more elbow room in our in our classrooms and uh, welcoming. I'm assuming we're going to get more students back on too. So that's, uh, that's been fabulous. Oh. Nice. <laughs> oh, my God. That's great. Thank you. That was the team today. And if we didn't have them, we would still be uh, trying to move furniture out for the next like five weeks. Wow. Thanks, well, Darius. That's great. And, and then just for some more outdoor space where we're looking at different options. Um, and the town, again, has been great at working with us. John Pachoric has helped to organize. I know this is going to sound silly but some um, stump eating because we're looking at creating some outdoor classrooms with stump. So yeah. Uh, and then you, I on the <laughs> Jen always cracks up at that one. And then on the read across America, I'll let you guys read that. All the information is there. Okay. Great. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Modesto. Do you have an? I don't have anything to add, only one quick question. Trevor, when is town elections this year for school committee? Great. Yes, thank you uh, for that lead in. So I am uh, not running again to uh, to fill the seat again. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping aside to make room for, uh, for another member of the community that wants to serve. Uh, elections are staying on their normal schedule, which would be the first Monday in May will be the elections this year. Um, town meeting obviously has moved and we believe it's June 12th at this point uh but elections will stay in may and um uh i have loved so much uh serving with all of you and and serving the community and i still love to be of any help i can anywhere i can but um i've got so much to do it's really hard to uh to fit every meeting in so i i'm just really so grateful to serve the community for this amount of time and i'll be here through april and um then make way for new fresh ideas Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Trevor. Um, you. Happen to know when the uh, deadline is for filing papers? Yes, 
Thank you. I believe it is the fifth. I'm almost positive the 15th is the last day to turn in your papers. You've been able to um, pick them up since May 1st um, uh, to and then get, you know, so many signatures. And then I believe it's the 15th is when you turn them in another five days. I, I, I'm almost positive. I could look it up, but I think that's right. Just for yes, it is March 15th. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Yep. Is that from our other candidate? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. In the in the off years, I can never remember to uh, to bring that up. Thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. So yes. Great. So any any community members or anyone that's aware of a community member that might be interested in participating on the school committee, please encourage them to try and get their their papers in by the fifteenth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. I have nothing else. So we have no need for executive session. We're down to adjournment. Would anyone care to make a motion? So we, we, we can sit around and chat for a while well, longer. To adjourn. <laughs> you, um, just one quick clarification. I'm, were we just being asked to sort of go and shake the bushes or did I understand from Trevor that somebody is interested in running? I have uh, I have spoke with a, a with a woman who is interested in serving and has filled out the papers. I believe turned them in, but I do not want to discourage anybody else. Of course not. Um, but I, yeah. Yes, but I do. Yes, I do know that there is somebody that's truly interested and has campaigned so okay. far. You know, at least got the papers. Um, but right. but I think there may be two. I think there may be others that okay. that are looking. So well, I, I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's good. Great. Yep. Thank that you. Was, I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that motion. And we will, I'm assuming there's no discussion. Uh, all, we will go and proceed to a vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp. Yes. Mary Raymond. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Yes. Carrie Edges. Yes. And it's unanimous. Thank you all very much for your efforts. Uh, good luck to all in the vaccination efforts that you're undertaking, um, yes. if you are undertaking them. Um, and uh, we'll see you all in April. <laughs>